So we're building a charger for people who park their EVs on the street at night and need to charge it there. And as part of this, we've created a lot of prototypes. We started with the Mark One and then Mark Two and Mark Three. And there's been a lot of problems that we've uncovered during that process. The Mark One, Two, and Three each have their own problems that I'll discuss in detail in this video and show why the Mark IV here overcomes them. And if you stick around to the end, I will show you why the Mark IV actually isn't the final solution either. So why would you need to charge an EV on the street? Well, as many of you may know, if you live in a city, most of the times you're not parking in a garage or in your driveway. A lot of times you'll just park on the street and you might not even have a garage to charge in. And this raises significant issues for EVs because EVs are ideally charged really slow overnight or at work, but generally speaking overnight at home using your electricity, which is one third to one quarter the cost of gasoline in most circumstances. So if you can't charge your EV at home, then you gotta go out to the DC fast charger. And the DC fast charger is expensive, very inconvenient, and there's not that many of them right now. You also might have to wait in line. Really, we need charging where people park overnight. And I talk about this a lot on the channel. The problem is today, the chargers that are out there are huge, meaning they're ugly, and they're just very expensive and hard to put in because the city has to put it in, um, there's a lot of permitting involved. It can take a year to get it in there. You got to request it. It's just lots of issues with getting these chargers out there. The biggest things that I saw was just the eyesore of them and then the inconvenience of getting them out there or the impossibility maybe of getting them out there. If they're very expensive, the city's not going to want to put it out, especially if it's just you using it and it's not, you know, a whole bunch of people getting utilization off of it. The same thing applies if it's a charge point operator, they are selling power to you. The price has to go up in that circumstance. Plus, they're not gonna wanna put it out if it's just one person using it because they, they'd have to charge you too much for it to be worth it. What we came up with with Cool Street, the company I founded, is an option that homeowners can install themselves. And this gets around the issue of the really long lead times. It also gets around the issue of cost. These things are comparable to the cost of a regular level two charger. And it also enables people to solve charging for themselves. They don't gotta wait around on the city to do it beyond the permitting and things like that, they can purchase these things, get it out there on their own, and they're good to go. And furthermore, we are offering it as a service to other people. So the electricity that is in, coming out of your charger can be metered to other drivers. And this enables you to really just share your electricity with the broader neighborhood. And this enables kind of a scaling of a network from the bottom up, instead of the city or a charge point operator pushing it from the top down. And we think this is really important, especially in the early stages of EV adoption that we have today. Anyways, I'm waxing eloquent about EV charging and all the nuances and the difficulties of that. But let's get back to the issue at hand today. And that is some of the challenges we've had as we built these prototypes. Let's start with the first challenge, and this was weather sealing. If you go back to the video on the Mark I, I'll put it up here, you can see that the biggest issue we uncovered with that prototype was that the electronics kind of failed after a period of time. And this was really due to the fact that those electronics were not really well weather sealed inside of the post. They were kind of just hanging out in there and they got a lot of condensation. And after about a half year of use, the thing shut down and stopped working. Now, I wasn't totally disappointed because those electronics were not even our own. They were off the shelf ones that we had repurposed. And it was really just a proof of concept. Does this work? Can I charge my car on the street? Does it you know, behave how I want it to? How's the detachable cable work? work? Things like that. How did we solve that in the Mark IV? Well, the Mark IV here is totally different than the original prototypes. Inside of the Mark IV is a entirely sealed box like this. This is a slightly different box than the one that's in there, but it's very similar to this. And this drops into the post. It's entirely sealed by gasketing around this guy, as well as uh, under this door into the cord or the cable socket. You also have sealing to the post, but that's less important because what's really important is making sure that the electronics are sealed inside the box. What I don't show here is there's a port at the bottom here for the wires coming in. There's a gland seal that goes into that to seal around the three individual conductors 
uh, going into the box. So totally sealed. What that means is this guy can stay out in the weather for a really, really long period of time and we're not having issues with condensation and things on the board. For what it's worth, we have used one of these guys outside for about a year and it's still going strong. So it definitely is holding up much, much better than that Mark I that failed in about six to nine months, as I said. I think it was about six months. We had started this on the Mark II. You can see the video of that up here as well. The Mark II box uh, was very complicated. It was not as simple as this box I just showed you. And so really what ended up happening was it was just too complicated to make. So we refined it through the Mark III and then the Mark IV. But the concept of weather sealing the box did not start with the Mark IV. It just kind of reached its perfection here in this prototype. The second issue we uncovered was with the Mark II. And if you remember back in that video, once again, link up here, you can see that we had created some custom electronics for that charger. And I had worked with a, an external board house to fabricate those boards. We got the boards in and it was the first iteration and first iterations always don't end up working. And so there was a bunch of issues there and things just didn't work. And, and I, I kind of hit a brick wall. I said, man, I do not know what's going on with these boards. How do I move forward from this with this huge obstacle of not having a functional charger, functional electronics? Because of that, we ended up having to learn how to do all of this in-house. It was an amazing learning experience. I'm glad we went through it. It taught us a lot about how we kind of need to control everything. We need to control the electronics and the hardware and the software, because if we do not, and somebody else is controlling it, you run into situations where you don't understand what's going on and all kinds of things can come up. I mean, we all know the supply chain issues back during the pandemic. Maybe you can't get a certain chip on your board. How long is it going to take to iterate your board to update to a new version? All of these things are considerations when you're bringing hardware to market. And by us learning it, yes, it did delay us a bit, but it means that we can build a much stronger foundation going forward. So the Mark III, we did not put electronics in, but the Mark IV, we did. And the Mark IV was our first charger with all of our own custom boards. Now, there was a bunch of iterations on this, so let me, let me go through this a little bit. The first board we made was the power board. And you can see that down in the bottom of the box here. But the power board was basically a, a trial board. It was, it was just a trial. How do we make PCBs? All of this thing. It's not a great PCB. Basically, what it was doing was taking the power from the supply, converting the AC into the four DC voltages we need, which is plus and minus 12 volts, 5 volts, and 3.3 volts. And then it also handled the relay was on this board. So the main power relay sat there with that. And then there would be communication from the controller to open and close that relay as the vehicle requested power. So the power board, it was kind of a cobbled together board that handled almost all the AC power and then generated the DC power that we needed. Now we could run the original uh, third party open EVSC board that we were using in the Mark I off of this guy. And that's what we did at first until we created our own control board. Our own control board is up here at the top. And so you can see we have wires running between it uh, up to the control board, which is basically handling all of the communications to and from the EVSC and the car. It's generating a one kilohertz square wave. It's generating the uh, duty cycle on that to tell the car how much power it can pull, how many amps it can pull. And it's also doing safety things like the GFCI or diode check or the other things that are required to get this thing certified. And then the final board we created was an LED board. And you can see this here, this whiteboard. This essentially surrounded the uh, socket and was what was used to light up this, this ring that you see here. So there's actually 10 LEDs. Actually, I think this is an early version, so it has eight but there's 10 LEDs around that board to, to light that up. This was the very first iteration of the Mark IV uh, PCBs. Now, we ended up creating a unified power PCB along the entire bottom of this box. That was kind of a later iteration. And then we created a little uh, edge attach control board. So the control board actually would slot vertically into that large uh, power PCB on the bottom. And then it would actually connect into the LED board too on the other end. So that way you didn't have any wire connections between the three boards. They would all just kind of slot into the case. And we went through many, many iterations of this. I think we went up to like iteration seven on the control boards, three or four on the LEDs and, and three, four or five on the power boards. It, it really was a, a process to go through all of those. Now, 
we have a lot of boards left over from this and I'm trying to think up a, a cool way to, uh, to utilize them. So stay posted for that. We might have something coming up soon uh, that you guys might be interested in. Ultimately, we ended up with a charger that works. That was our own electronics that had the light functions that we wanted, all of the safety features we needed. It worked well with a socket. That was a new thing too, adding that in. That's not typical for the American market and also fit into our form factor. So I was very happy with how those electronics developed over the course of nine months or so. And we ended up with what's in the Mark IV that you see here. So the third issue was actually something that I highlighted in the Mark III. This box slides into the top of the post like so. And I wanted a way to secure this to the post that was not going to introduce all kinds of penetrations and make this look kind of ugly. And the Mark III, uh, if you remember, I was experimenting with different ways to attach the charge box inside the post. The Mark III in particular had some bolts behind the socket that would get driven into the backside of the post. I thought that was an interesting way to secure it in here, um, but ultimately we decided to go a different way. And so let me show you that. If you look at the box inside of the Mark IV, you'll see there's this angled edge on the back. This angled edge uh, mates up with this guy, which is a wedge. And the wedge has a nut and a bolt, and the nut fits into this little groove here. And you can see it fits right onto the back of the box. So this is in the loose position. The wedge is up. As you drive the bolt on the top here, it's a security Torx head, that will drive the wedge down and it will thicken. So what this does is it allows it to, so what this does is it allows you enough room to slip it into the top when it's loose, and then you drive that bolt, which drives the wedge, pushes this front edge through the opening in the post, locks everything into place. One extra little thing I did was I added a heavy spring under the bolt head. And what this does is when the bolt is tensioned down, that spring has tension on it. And so if there is any expansion or contraction of anything in the post, that spring will help hold tension down on the wedge and keep everything secure. Not going anywhere. Now, there's a bunch more on the Mark IV, and I really should dig into some of the nitty gritty of that. If you guys wanna see that, just give this thing a thumbs up, add some comments, let me know. There's so many things I could go over with this. It, it basically was the first charger we actually ended up using an aluminum post, so we could actually build this and machine it in-house. Uh, we have some ventilation features for extra airflow through this, so it doesn't get quite so hot. And I didn't even get into the door, uh, we have this nice hidden door with a socket receptacle, um, and that that actually is, is very nice. That's probably one of the, the cooler features of this is the door. Unfortunately, the Mark IV is not what we will be going with with our first generation product. The Mark IV was really the finest iteration of our charger where we had the electronics in the post. Ultimately, we decided to move the charger electronics out of the post. And this was a hard change for me. It took me a while to come to that determination. But the reason we did this, well, there was three reasons. And the one was for safety. If this guy would get hit out on the curb, there would be live wires inside of it. And moving the charger upstream of that into the house means there's only power here when the vehicle is connected and requesting a charge. So it makes it quite a bit safer. Uh, in that regard. The second was communication with a Wi-Fi chip in here. We're able to make a cheaper device than having a cellular chip in it. Um, it also allows you to not have to pay service plans on the cellular. There, there's some benefits to that, but if it's at the curb, you might need a repeater to get your Wi-Fi out there. So moving it in the house solves that issue. And then the third one is just thermals. Um, this guy is pushing a lot of power through a small package and it can get kind of hot, especially if the sun's hitting it. So there is ways around that. There is some things we could do to this to make it behave more nicely in the heat, but ultimately moving it into the house kind of negates that issue too. Now, the solution we're coming up with, I'm really excited about it because we can apply it to a lot more areas more easily too. It doesn't have to be in a post. It doesn't have to be on the street. Um, it'll look somewhat similar to this uh, in some applications, but um, it really opens up the gamut to if you want this in a post, if you want it on a wall, um, different things like that are now available with the new solution. As you know, I will have more videos coming up on our future progression of this. We aren't quite ready to offer something for sale to you guys, but that is coming. I will have something coming up soon, though, that you guys can chip in and maybe help contribute. Uh, so if you're interested in that, keep following and uh, I'll have details soon. And I will see you guys in the next video.